I am um, going to start class in about two minutes here. I'm just going to put in the code for the phone conference before we get started. Haribo, Haribo. Dundavats, Dundavats. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, I'm going to ask the votees to, to go ahead before we get started here and, and to kind of mute out because I have to do simultaneously a Facebook Live broadcast. I'll explain everything as we go along. So. Yeah, okay. I was talking a little bit about that point we went over yesterday. Okay. Right. All right, so I will bring that up, Bumi, but I, I just, I'm already on the Facebook Live, so I got to get started. Okay, go ahead. Go All right. Okay, Harry I'll Everybody's got to mute out. If you don't mute out, I will mute you out. Mute out everyone. Okay. Everybody mute out. Okay. Mute out everyone. Okay. Okay. Mute out everyone. 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 विश्वम्भरो द्विजवरो युगदाम पालो वंदे जगत प्रिया करो करुणा अवतारो आनंद लीलामय विग्रहाय हेमंत वत्स विशुंदराय तस्मय महाप्रेम वर्ष प्रदाय श्री चैतन्य चंद्राय नमो नमोस्ते कास्तुरी तिल कमल लत पुतले वक्षले न कोष्टवम न सागरे वर मुक्तिकम करतरम वेनु कर कंकनम सब अंग हरि चंदनम सुललितम कंत मुक्त बली राजास्त्रियो परिवेष्टि दो विजयते गोपाल चूडमणि हे श्री श्याम सुंदर शिखर शेखर स्मिर मनोहर लरिक रसिक मम कृपनि सुप्रिय चरण किंग कुरी गुरु तवाय वस्मि तवाय वस्मि न जीवामि तय विन इति विज्ञाय राधे तम नय मम चरणन्ति यत्किंकरे शुभहु सकलु ककवनि नित्य पुरुष पुरुष शशकंदमलि तस्य गदारस निधि विसवनु जस्त तत्केलि कुंज भवनंगन मंजारी श्याम जामे राधारविंद नेत्र स्मरा मे राधा मधुर स्मृत शम वदा राधा करुणा वराज तथो मनोस्ती गतिन कपी भक्ता विहीन यपराध लक्ष्य क्षिप्त मोदी तोरंग मजे कृपा मयि तं शरण प्रापन वृंदे नमस्ते चरणारविंद so so this is a kind of special thing. Normally every Monday night I have a telephone conference which has been going on for 17 years, especially by the grace of Sriman Bhumapati Prabhu and other devotees. They've maintained a consistency of doing this started. for over 17 years now. Um, and normally every Monday so far for many years, uh, by the grace of those devotees, they've allowed me to facilitate on Monday nights basically a question and answer class which focuses on the things or topics which we have discussed or whatever literature we're reading during that time. I did receive a order, I'll say, from Srila Bhukti Vinata Sinanti Maharaj, Pakishwab Sinanti Maharaj, that I should, for the sake of Guru Seva, especially leading up to the centennial of Guru Dev, and also because it's Kartik Mas, that I should do something live, uh, like we're doing now, um, for that Seva. So I took that that's an order, and uh, in order to accommodate it, I thought at least I could merge the two things. Uh, we have the phone conference every Monday, so it was very convenient. At the same time, I'm not very technical, so he said, all you have to do is push a button. And my daughter reassured me, so I'm hoping this is working. I've pushed the Facebook Live button, and hopefully this is working. So uh, if it's not working, somebody could type, I guess, in there and tell me, no, it's either not working or we don't have sound or, uh, you know, whatever else might be the case. Um, the format that we're going to use is I'm going to run a series um, over the Kartik Mas, and it will simply be 
a subject matter which I have covered uh, during my last traveling and preaching. Um, and I thought it was an interesting subject matter, and Maharaj also thought it was an interesting subject matter. And because it also had a great deal of focus on the Sandarbhas of Jiva Goswami Pad, he thought it was an excellent thing to, to use as a subject matter for this sort of seminar format that we'll go through over the next four weeks doing Karti. So essentially what it is, is a journey of the soul or Atma from its condition and bondage state to what it is when it attains perfection in bhakti or Krishna praying. So over the next four classes, we'll try to systematically go through those different developments beginning tonight with describing the basics of Atma Tattva as they've been described by Jiva Goswami and inevitably other works will come in. It's not possible, I don't think, to do any kind of class and to have a singular focus only on one uh, sastra because all of the sastras are united. They function in conjunction with each other. They verify each other. They reiterate the, the themes uh, that are stated. So it's, it's, it's not that you can do like one sastra and that's it. Now some, some people take a focus like that, but inevitably other sastra will come in. This is obvious. So, but the main text that we're dealing with will come from the writings of Jiva Goswami Pad, especially this evening from the Paramatma Sandarbha. Uh, Jiva Goswami Pad, uh, if you don't know, and I'm sure most uh, who are on the line of devotees and do know, that Siva Go Jiva Goswami Pad has compiled six Sandarbhas. Four of these Sandarbhas deal with the subject matter of Sambandha Gyan. Then Bhakti Sandarbha deals with the subject matter of how to practice Bhakti or Avideya. And Priti Sandarbha deals with the perfectional stage of Bhakti or Krishna Prem and what is Priti or love. Uh, and that's dealt with as our Prayogin in the Priti Sandarbha. So in the way of understanding and, and developing the foundational relationship with Bhagavan, an essential question has to be answered. And we are very fortunate that Sriman Sanatana Goswami Pad he asked that very question to Sriman Mahaprabhu in the 20th chapter of Majalila. There he asked, Ke ami? Ke ne amai jare tapatrai? He asked two essential questions. One was, who am I? And the second question is, why am I suffering under the influence of the three modes of material nature? So when Sriman Mahaprabhu heard that question from Sanatana Goswami Pad, he first told, and of course you know the answers. You know the answers. You are highly qualified associate of mine and you know the answers to these questions. But this is the nature of Vaishnavatva. This is the nature of Vaishnav, sadhus, that they will ask questions for the benefit of others. So Sanatana Goswami Pad, he asked these two questions and though he himself is a Nitya Parikara Bhagavan, in the Leela or Gaur Leela, He's asking these questions especially for our benefit. So Sri Mahaprabhu gave an answer, and he gave the answer in a summary form by answering both sides of the question. One, Jivera Sarup Hoya Krishna Nitya Das. Who are you? Everyone is by constitution the Das of Krishna. But why am I suffering? Ah, Jivera Tashta Shakti Ved Abe Prakash. Because even though every jiva by constitution is the servant of Krishna, the very nature of the jiva is tatashta swabhav. So this word tatashta has been explained many times, many places, but tata essentially means that which is like a border. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur gave a very nice comparison that the tata is like the imperceptible line of demarcation that is between the ocean or any body of water and the land. So someplace within those two, there's an imperceptible line which demarcates a separation of land and water. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur used this example to describe what it is to be tata sta. Sta means to be situated. So to be situated in a marginal position between the two primary shaktis of Bhagavan, the Antaranga Shakti or internal potency and the Bahiranga Shakti or external energy or Maya. So 
the jivas being of the nature of to touch the shakti have certain characteristics. Now, Srila Jiva Goswami Pad, he did a very amazing thing. There is a science called ontology. Ontology means to study the very nature or being of something. Sometimes to do that, you have to extract that thing you want to study. You have to extract it from what conditions it may be situated in so that you can actually analyze it. Scientists do this all the time. For instance, uh, if you want to study the nature of the human heart, well, obviously the human heart functions being within a body and carrying out its functions. But if you want to observe the functions of a heart, you somehow have to be able to extract it from the human body, place it in a, um, a laboratory situation, and be able to look at it, analyze it, how does it function, how does it work, what's going on. So obviously for medical science and many other um, uh, developments, they do things like this. So in the same way, Srila Jiva Goswami Pad, he has taken the nature of the Atma, the Jivatma, and he has separated it from either one of its conditions. So what are the conditions of the Jiva? There are only two states of existence for every Jiva. One is if the Jiva is eternally liberated or perfected, or the Jiva may have become perfected. The other state of existence is that of bondage. So these are the only two states of a Jiva. There is no third state of the Jiva. Now, in order to describe the very nature of what is the Tashta Swabhav, what is the Atma, Jiva Goswami took the ontological approach and sort of extracted the jiva from the conditioned state and analyzed just the nature, the very being of what is an atma and what is jiva shakti, etc. So in the Paramatma Sandarbha, Anuched 19, beginning, it goes from 19 till about 47. But there he's gone on to describe the very nature of the atma. This is important because in Sanatana Goswami Pad's question, which is essentially our question, we have to understand actually what we are. And the only way to do that is to understand the very nature of our being. Because obviously we have been <laughs> in illusion from time without beginning and have never been able to see or realize or actualize the very nature that we have. We've always been in a false narrative, so to speak, in a conditioned narrative based on the influence of illusion, which we'll get to. But let's read what Jiva Goswami Pad has written, and we'll describe point by point uh, his analysis of the Atma. So first he describes that every person is an Atma. Atma means the individual living souls. They are called Jiva because they belong to the category of Jiva Shakti. So Krishna said, Maman Bamso Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. This category of being a Jiva or Atma separated from Bhagavan as an individual is Sanatana. It's an eternal reality. So now Jiva Goswami is going to describe what is the nature of that Atma. He begins in Anuchya 19 by describing what the Atma is not. So he says, Atma na devo. So Atmana Devo means that there are so many different species of life. In the human category, there are 400,000 variations, not nuances, just variations of basic platforms of consciousness. 400,000. This is everything from the most gross level of human existence all the way up to the devatas or demigods. So Jiva Goswami starts off by saying, Atmana Devo. Even though the quality of consciousness, the status of life, the intellectual capacity, even the capacity to enjoy sensually is so extremely high in the body of the devatas, Jiva Goswami wants us to know right off the bat, even the highest quality of the human category of consciousness is not the Atma. Atma na devo, na naro. One may think, well, the state of heavenly existence, swarga, the heavenly planets, they are obtained by good karma, 
Therefore, maybe I can understand myself to be not all means the human platform in the earthly sense. Right? So one could think, well, by being a human being, I can attain the heavenly planet. So he may be saying, though I'm not a demigod, right? I'm actually just a regular human being who has potential to attain such a status. But he says, no, not not all. The Atma is also not in the category that we consider just human being. Right? He's not that either. Gatiryak. Certainly, the Jiva, especially the Atma who's come into the human form of life, can understand I'm very different from Tiryak means animals. So animals have four basic propensities. Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. So obviously, in the human condition, human consciousness, hopefully, most humans can differentiate that I'm not like Tiryak, like animals who are restricted in their conscious expression to only eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Now, there are nuances within that. Each animal also exists within one category of the modes of nature. I don't want to deflect from our uh, focus to go into those kind of things. But we know, uh, na tiryak, stavro na cha. Stavro na cha means like plants, rocks, other things which are immovable. Right? He says, we're also not of that category. Then he says, na deha nindriyam. So we are definitely, in other words, he's summarizing here. You're not the body. Huh? Na deho, you're not this body. Right? So now that will raise the question naturally. Asanatha Goswami Pad raised to Mahababu. Now they hold, I'm not this body. Therefore, I must not be any of the designations related to this body. Therefore, Kami, who am I? So he goes on to say, it is possible because there are six Vedic schools of thought. And in some Vedic schools of thought, they describe the nature of the Atma, though not being any of the things I mentioned above, na devo, na naro, na tiyak, na stavro, na the physical deha, uh, and even they say, not the material senses, but they say that the Atma is actually not different from the mind. Right? That the mind is actually the Atma. Because the mind has the ability to, to have acceptance and rejection of things which come from the intellectual facility or D. D means intellect, intelligence. So those things which due to past impressions come to our intelligence, right, from our memory bank, from our computer storage, right, and then come to the mental platform for acceptance and rejection based on how they give us enjoyment or suffering, some schools of thought actually equate the Atma with the mind and that process. But Jiva Goswami says, not only Nindriyam, but Naeva Manaha Prano Na Napi Dihi. He's also not the mental function. Even the five or ten types of pran that run in the body, within everyone, there are ten types of traveling air. It is called pran. Five are primary. The consciousness of the jiva travels throughout the body via these avenues of pran. So one could think, oh, maybe the atma is actually related directly to this pran. So Rupa Goswami says, no, he is neither the mental function. He is not the life air, the pran. Huh? Not be the he, and he's not the intellectual function. So now having destroyed all of the possible conceptions that we may think we are, Jiva Goswami Pad now goes on to describe particular characteristics of the Atma, huh? beginning with two things. Na jado, na bikari. The Atma is not inert. Jad means inert. That means the Atma is a living thing. So this is very interesting because now Jiva Goswami Pad says, although the Atma is not in any of the above mentioned categories that we see as existence and living reality, right, according to our influenced by the modes of nature and by ignorance, etc. He's not inert. That means the Atma itself is dynamic. Though he's not any of these designations, the Atma itself is dynamic. Na jaro, na vikari, and is not subject to vikar. The word vikar means subject to change. So this becomes important. Why? Because one question that naturally arises 
what Sanatana Goswami Pad raised was, Gene am I jare tapatrai? Why am I suffering? What happened that made me begin to suffer? Therefore, was there something about the Atma that allows it to come under transformation? And coming under transformation puts it in a position where it is naturally disposed to suffering. So Jiva Goswami is arguing, no. No, not at all. That the Atma is Navikari. The Atma never changes. So there's nothing in the Atma itself which changes that makes it susceptible to suffering. Now we'll have to get into some nuances later on, probably in our next session, regarding the teachings of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Because in Jaiva Dharma, he apparently describes Vikar. But we'll have to discuss what that particularly means. Because here Jiva Goswami is very clear, na vikari. The very nature of the Atma itself does not undergo Vikar. It doesn't undergo any transformation. Jnana Matra Atmako. So Jnana Matra means there are some schools of thought among the six Vedic schools of thought in India, some think that the Atma actually only exists by the combination of consciousness with Jnanindriya. So in other words, when consciousness comes in contact with the senses and everything, that forms a being who's the Atma. <laughs> so Jiva Goswami says, no, this is also not acceptable in our Gaudiya Siddhant. Right? Actually, this is not acceptable in Siddhant, period, but he's specifically saying in Gaudiya Siddhant, no, this is not the conception, that the Jiva is Gyan Matra, right? That he's a combination of consciousness and the Gyanandriya coming together, and that forms the Atma. No. Now he describes actually what is the Atma, because now after you go through and delineate everything the Atma is not, the natural question is, well, then what am I? What actually am I? So now a very beautiful phrase he uses, and we'll have to go through this a little bit carefully, and I'll try to slow down as well. Shwashmai Shwayam Prakash. So the first quality of the Atma that Jiva Goswami Pad describes is, he is Shwashmai Shwayam Prakash. So Shwayam Prakash means something that is self-luminous. Now I'm going to give an example. Any lamp, uh, when you turn the lamp on, in the state when it's on and illuminate and illuminated, then it can reveal itself, and it reveals other things which are in its presence. This is called swayam prakash, something that illuminates itself and illuminates other things which are in its proximity. That is called swayam prakash. But Jiva Goswami has used the word preceding that, shwashmai. Shwayam Prakash. So what is Shwashmai? So giving the same example of a lamp. If you take a lamp and the lamp is turned on, it will illuminate its own features and anything else that's in that room will also be revealed. If you're in the kitchen, you turn the light on, the pots, the sink, the stove, everything will be revealed that's in that proximity. The very light itself, the light bulb, the light switch, everything will also be revealed. But can... The light know itself. No, because simply being luminous is not a quality of self-realization. So let me go through this again. Though a light may reveal itself in terms of the form, like you can see, if you turn a lamp on, you see the lamp itself, right? You can also see other things that are in proximity huh, to that lamp. This is called Swayam Prakash. But the word Sushmai means that thing which not only can illuminate itself, illuminate other things, but is capable of knowing itself. So I would request that anybody who is unclear about that, and I very well may be not expert at explaining it, please type something and let me know this is not clear, Mukunda Babu. Can you reiterate it? Okay, I'm going to go through it one more time again. Sushmai, Swayam Prakash means something that has the ability to understand itself, like the Atma. You can realize who you are. Not only that, but not only will you realize yourself, but you can also realize other people, and other people can also see you, right? Those who are self-realized, they can actually see your Atma, etc., etc. So this is the meaning of Swashmai Swayam Prakash. 
That thing which illuminates itself, illuminates others, and is capable of knowing its own existence. Unlike a regular material lamp or something, though it gives illumination and it shows its own form and it reveals other forms in the room, it's incapable of knowing itself. You understand? I'm getting messages at the same time. Okay. Now, second thing. Shwashmai Shwayam Prakash. Shat Ekarupa Sarupabak. So here the word Ekarup means that the Atma, unlike our material existence, does not have, huh? It does not have, hold on one second. I'm getting messages from Maharaj. Uh, let me get one second here just to make sure what is going on. Please bear with me one second. I don't know if Maharaj is trying to get on and perhaps can't. So let me just take his message here and then we'll continue. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Let's get back to where we were. Okay. Ekarupa Swarupa Bhak. So Ekarup here means unlike the material existence of the jiva, which is composed of three different forms. One, the actual atma itself. Two, shukshma sharir. It means a subtle body composed of a hankara, mind, and intelligence. They are resting on the chitta, which is an expansion of consciousness, which is, and I'll use this description often because it's very apropos, it's like a flat screen TV, so to speak. <laughs> On that flat screen TV is where the impression of the ahamkar, also the mental function and intellectual function, mana and di, those three functions are making impression on the chitta. Right? So this is called antakaran or the subtle body. So you have the atma, you have a subtle body or shukshma sharia, and then a body composed of eight of five elements, earth, water, fire, and ether, in some particular combination according to your karma. So every jiva who is influenced in relation to the material world has essentially three forms, right? The atma itself, a subtle body, and a gross body. So here Jiva Goswami says, what about the atma itself, unconditioned by material life? It is ek rup. Ek rup means it has only one form that's uniform in nature. There is no subtle body, gross body, the Atma itself becomes its own body upon attaining perfection. You understand? So there's no need for a subtle and gross body. And I'll get to why that's not necessary as we move on. So Ekarupa Sarupa Bhak. Chaitana Vyakta Shilas. So Vyakta Shila means the ability to spread throughout the body. So the Atma, even though it's one ten thousandth the tip of a hair, this is a a pictorial comparison to try to describe the Atma. Actually, none of these things can adequately describe the actual appearance or nature of the Atma. Right? So, Sastra has used many things. Uh, they're called Upamana. Upamana means comparisons. Right? In order to kind of describe or give some kind of picture, some kind of indication of what the Atma is. So, describe the minuteness, to describe the minuteness of the Atma, Sometimes it is used that it is one ten thousand the tip of a hair. So, of course, you take a piece of your hair out, break off all the parts, <laughs> so you get down to one ten thousandth the tip, and they're saying, essentially, for an example, that's the size of the Atma. Now, in, this, in an elephant, all Atmas are of the same nature, right? So, in the body of an elephant, the Vyapta Shila here means that that Atma, although so small, has the ability to expand its consciousness to accommodate the body of an elephant. In the same way, if you have an ant, which is very small, Vyaptashila means it expands to accommodate the size of the body of that ant. <coughs> so, 
So Vyapta Shila means the ability of the Atma to spread its consciousness according to the particular type of form it has. Vyapta Shila Sha Chit Ananda Atmaka. Chit Ananda Atmaka. So Chit Ananda Atmaka means that the Jeeva is essentially Sat Chit Ananda. Now this requires explanation because in my speaking to many devotees, sometimes what is Sat Chit Ananda and what is Ladini Samvit and Sandini, which I'll explain a little later on, sometimes becomes conflated and confused. Right? Sometimes the two conceptions become mixed up. So here Jiva Goswami Pad is only saying the Atma is Chit Ananda Atmaka. So Chit means he's conscious. Ananda Atmaka means he clearly explained in his commentary. Dukkha Pratyogita. So Dukkha Pratyogita means in the Atma itself there is no misery. And Rasyam Evam Lavda, Lavda Nandi Bhavati. He's capable of when he comes in contact with Rasa. He's capable of experiencing unlimited blissfulness. But in the stage that he's analyzing here, which is not the stage in which he's become perfect. Remember, there are two stages, perfected stage and conditioned stage. Jiva Goswami's analysis here is only ontological. He's looking at the Atma not being perfected and not being conditioned. He's just describing the nature of the Atma itself. So now he says he's Chit Ananda Atmaka. So Chit means conscious. And by being conscious, it axiomatically or automatically indicates he's existing. So no need to mention the word Sat. Chit Ananda Atmaka. In his Atma, there is Dukkha Pratyogitwa. Right? Dukkha Pratyogitwa means he has no misery. So this raises an amazing question. If there is no misery in the Atma, from where has misery come to the Atma? It's not in the nature of the Atma itself. He clearly says, Dukkha Pratyogitwa. Nyai is one school of thought in the six Vedic schools. So Nyai and Vaisheshik are two related schools. Particularly Mahaprabhu was very fond of Navin Nyai. Navin Nyai is a system of logic which is very amazing. Again, I don't want to detract and go down a path that's not directly related to what we're talking about. But Pratyogitwa is in Nyai. Right? And in Nyai, Pratyogi means something which is sort of the antithesis or the complete opposite of something else. The word Pratyogita. Right? So the Atma is the Pratyogitwa of Dukkha. It means it is a complete opposite. It has no correlation. There's no relationship between misery and the Atma. So now I know everyone will say, why am I suffering? This is the same question Sanatana Goswami Pad had. Why am I suffering then? If there's no misery in the Atma, how am I suffering? We're going to get to that. So he says, Chit Ananda Atma Kastata Aham Arata. Right? We read in Bhagavad Gita, Prakriti Kriyamanani Gunai Kamani Savasha Aham Karavimulatma Kartaham Itti Manyate. That every jiva is actually bewildered thinking they're the doer of all kinds of activities when actually these activities are being carried out by the modes of material nature. A combination of their karma, the modes of material nature, their desires, it's all mixing together and creating a narrative in their material life. So now he's asking, huh? but what is the meaning here, ahamartha? So even though the jiva is not the ahamkara, the false ego, he is a real person. He is a real entity with his own identity. So Jiva Goswami says he's aham artha. He has an actual value of self-identity, even though that identity has nothing to do with the material world. Right? Because we know, you know, we're practicing bhakti. So we know that if we become successful in practicing bhakti, we will obtain our spiritual identity. So here's the indication of that in this phrase, aham artha. It is natural to the soul to have a spiritual identity, spiritual form, spiritual relationships, etc. So there is a real narrative, a transcendental narrative related to the Atma. Therefore, he's Aham Arta. He has a natural individual 
a value or reality that's not the false ego or hamkar. Pratik Setram, Pratik Setram means, and every Atma is individual. So Jiva Goswami points this out because many schools of thought, they say all of the Atmas, once they become free from the influence of ignorance, they merge together and they're one collective, one homogenous reality. Jiva Goswami is pointing out, no. Just like Krishna pointed out in Bhagavad Gita, Jiva Bhutta Sanatana, the individuality of Bhagavan and the Jiva, and the individuality of one jiva and another jiva is a permanent and eternal reality. So every jiva has his own kshetra. Kshetra means a field of activity. And he's the knower or kshetra gyan of that field of activities. So prati means each individual one. Right? So every jiva is an individual. Bina anur. Bina anur means... They are separated parts and parcels of Bhagavan. We've already quoted that verse from Bhagavad Gita. And they are Anu. Anu here, we always translate it as atomic, indicating size. But here, really, Anu means it is the last possible... There's no division from this point. Like in the material world, we talk about splitting the atom, right? Right? So really when you apply the term Anu or Adam here, it doesn't mean Adam exactly like the material conception of Adam. Here Anu means that thing which cannot have any further division. So the Atma is of a nature that it is no longer dividable. That is the smallest manifestation. If you take Bhagavan, his expansion, his expansion, the next expansion, the next expansion, the final expansion is the Jivatma. This is the real meaning of Anu. He is the final expansion. Nothing can get finer or further subdivided from that point. Right? Nitya Nirmalaha. Nitya Nirmalaha means that atomic, that Atma is always pure. Again, questions will arise. If Jiva Goswami is saying that the Atma is Nitya Nirmala, he's eternally pure, how did we get into this condition? How did impurities come upon the Atma if he's Nitya Nirmala? So Jiva Goswami is saying that the Atma in its nature, in its own Swarup, and the Swarup here doesn't mean Siddhadeha. This is another thing that has to be understood. In Sanskrit, Swarup has many meanings. So Swarup literally could mean your own form. It could mean the Siddhadeha. But Swarup also means nature. So here Jiva Goswami is talking about the very nature of the Atma. Not as Siddhadeya is speaking here. The very nature of the Atma is its Nitya Nirmala. It has no contamination. Because we read earlier, he's Navikari. The very nature of the Atma doesn't change. So it doesn't accommodate becoming soil. Or, or becoming contaminated. I'm going to explain how we think we're contaminated very soon. So he's Nitya Nirmala. He's completely and always pure, right? Pure here doesn't also necessitate realization of Bhagavan in your relationship, right? Nitya Nirmala is simply speaking to the quality of the Atma. It has capacity in that pure condition when we are free from ignorance to accommodate the descent of Swarup Shakti. This is a discussion that we'll get to before the night's over with, which is the big thing of the difference between Statements like Nitya Nirmala meaning being spiritually realized and Nitya Nirmala meaning one is capable of accommodating the descent of Swarup Shakti. So let me get to everything and then we'll come back and it'll become more clear. Tata Gyanatva Kartatva Bhuktatva We just got through reading the verse from Bhagavad Gita Prakriti Kriyamonani. Hey, no, the Jiva, he is completely not the doer. So here, the meaning in Bhagavad Gita is that the jiva is not the doer of material activities which are enacted within the context of the three modes of material nature. But the jiva does have kartatva, or the ability to do. When he enters into the spiritual realm, he will become kartatva. How will he become kartatva? Oh, in his capacity of seva, in any particular rasa, he will do so many different kinds of service. These services are generated from his kartator, his ability to serve. So the Atma is not devoid of the ability to do things. It is just a misunderstanding to think that the Atma 
is the doer of material activities. He's not. That's why he said, Ahamkara vimud atma. He's bewildered thinking that the, that the atma is doing all the material activities. He's simply the observer of material activities, and he has icha, right? So his misplaced icha or desire appears to be carrying out activities in the material world. He's actually not. But in the spiritual context, that icha to serve Krishna is an actuality of the soul itself. So he is kartatwa. Gyanatwa means he has the capacity to know, which means he can know himself, he can know Bhagavan, he can know his relationship, he can know everything related to the spiritual world, and Bhoktatwa. It means he has the capacity to be enjoyer. Here his capacity to be the enjoyer means in the context of being Haridasa. There's a natural bliss inherent in being Haridasa. So it doesn't mean he's the enjoyer as Krishna's Bhoktaram Jagyatapasam. It doesn't mean he's the Bhokta like that. It means the Jivatma is Bhoktatwa as the Das of Krishna, because inherent in serving Krishna is so much bliss. So then Jiva Goswami concludes with two other things. Paramatmaika Seshitwa Swabhav. He says the natural Dham of every Atma is that he is the Paramatmaika Seshitwa. The word Sesh means remainder, right? Just like we know about Ananta Sesh, right? So Seshitwa means the remainder of something. So we are the final byproduct coming from Paramatma, right? In the Jiva Shakti, all the different Jivas manifest from a particular expansion of Bhagavan according to their position. Those Jivas, for instance, who are eternally serving Bhagavan in Nitya Golok Vrindavan Dham, who serve in Braja, they are manifest from Sri Bhaladev Tattva, right? Except for those gopis who are Kaya Vyuha of Radhika. This is a different discussion. Those who are manifest as Nitya Parikars, their forms, their bodies, everything is manifest from Sri Bhavadevji. Those eternal associates of Vaikuntha Dham, they are manifest from Sankarashan. And those Jivas who are the Tatashta Jivas in this world, they are manifest from the Paramatma. Now, sometimes it becomes confusing because the devotees say, well, wait, wait, Mukunda, we've heard that devotees come through the glance of Mahavishnu. This is how they come into the material world in the cycling of the creation. There's creation, then there's partial dissolution, then complete dissolution of the material world, then again the material world manifests. At that time, from the glance of Mahavishnu, jivas come back and forth into the world. But the actual where they're manifest from and manifest here is Bhaktivinoda Thakur said this clearly, because the jivas are eternal, using words like manifest, created, etc are just indications because something eternal cannot be manifested at a particular time or created at a particular time. But we don't have another vocabulary to accommodate trying to describe these things. Therefore, in the 15th chapter of Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, be careful. Don't get caught in the use of prakat basya, means the material words. We're using them only as a way to try to describe the nature of something by indication. Right? So the jivas in this world, they are Paramatma Kaseshitva. They are actually a manifestation from Paramatma. Right? So, this is the outline Jiva Goswami Pad has given, beginning Anuched 19 of Paramatma Sandarbha. Right? And quoting from the Padma Purana, Uttarakhand of Padma Purana. This is the Sastra it comes from. He took these things also from Jaimatri Rishi. Jaimatri Rishi was a Acharya in the line of Ramanuja Acharya. And the way that he commented on these verses from the Uttarakhana Padma Purana, Jiva Goswami found so much juice or so much relationship with the Gaudiya Siddhanta Mahaprabhu that he used this commentaries of Jaimatri Rishi to describe the ontological nature of the Atma. So this is the basic outline of the Atma. It's a lot to digest, right? It's the basic outline of the Atma. We can certainly revisit it, go back, and try to understand these things in more details. But I did want to get to tonight, certainly, an explanation of how the Jivas have come into the condition that they're in. Because it's always a big question, 
devotees have, you know, read and understood, having heard from Srila Gurudev, from our Srila Prabhupada, so many different narratives <laughs> that sometimes it's become a little bit confusing. So let me first read what Jiva Goswami has written. Now this is the first verse, Anuched 1 of Bhakti Sundarva. So we're not going to really be dealing with Bhakti Sundarva until we get to the portion on Bhakti, but before he begins discussing Bhakti, he addresses this issue about how the jivas are in the condition where the practice of bhakti is necessary to realize all the things I just previously described about the nature of the atma. So there he says, Paramatma vaibhava gonane cha tatashta shakti rupanam. So he says, previously, in the Paramatma Sandarbha, I already began discussing, as we just did, what is the nature of the jivatma. I described this already in the, in the Paramatma Sandarbha. But before we begin our sojourn in Bhakti, I want to explain how during that time I also spoke about the Tatasta Shakti Jivas. And I want to explain how these Tatasta Shakti Jivas have manifested or have found themselves, I think this is a better word, have found themselves in this condition that we call a material existence. So he says, Paramatma Vai Bhava Gona Ne Cha Tatasta Shakti Rupanam Chit Ekarasanam. So here he's saying that the Tatasta Shakti Jivas, they are Chit Ekarasanam. So the word Chit here means conscious. They are conscious Ekarasanam. So here the word Rasa does not mean Rasa like Rasa that comes from Rati. Right? Rati means love of God. When Rati is mixed with certain ingredients called Rasa Samagri, like Vaibhav, Anubhav, etc., it becomes Rasa. Right? Description is given, Vyatiti Bhavana Vatma, Yas Chadmatkara Bharabahu. The description of Rasa is given in Bhakti Rasmira Sindhu Group Goswami Pad. Right? But here, Chit Ekarasanam does not mean that kind of Rasa. Chit Ekarasanam here means a neutrality. He's only conscious of one kind of neutral disposition. <coughs> Excuse me. Because the jiva has, this is part of being tatashta swabhav. Tatashta swabhav means being in a middle position between material and, and, and spiritual reality. Right? Now, let me clarify one other thing before I go on. The idea of being in between material and spiritual reality is not a historical and location narrative. What I mean by that, we were not sitting somewhere in a particular locale and we were there and then decided to go one way or another. So I'm going to have to address this because I know many devotees, this is the running narrative, but I have to explain why it's the running narrative, right? But this is not the actual thing. I'm going to get to why in a minute. So he says, these jivas are chit ekarasanam. They have a neutral disposition. Because this is the nature of tashta, excuse me, tatashta swabhav, this neutral disposition, the result of that, right? Api anari parma tattva jnanam samsara gabhava maya. Right? So now he says, the result of being neutral or tatashta swabhav is that one can be influenced by either the spiritual energy or material energy. But now the question comes, well, what happened? When did I do one or the other? And obviously, if we're on this, <laughs> and I'm begging forgiveness now, but I'm guessing, obviously, if we're on this, this live stream or phone conference, we obviously didn't get to the other side. <laughs> so finding ourselves in the material condition, right? The question becomes, when did this happen and how did it happen? So Jiva Goswami says, Api Anadi Paratattva Gyanam Samsaga Bhava Maya. So let's deal with it one word at a time. Anadi. So in Tattva Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami has gone over the definitions of four words Anadi, Ananta, Nitya, and Anitya. Right? The word Anadi in this context means time without any beginning. Therefore, the Jiva's disposition of being related to material energy 
did not happen at a particular time. It is anadi, without any beginning. Now, within the writings of our Srila Prabhupada, right, the editors who were helping with the books, there was a big discussion because at one point, I read the history of this, there was an idea to write the Tattva Sandarbha. In the Tattva Sandarbha, this word anadi has been defined. So there was a dilemma whether to use the direct description given in Tattva Sandarbha. And the difficulty would be that because devotees had been hearing and speaking so much that the jiva has been uh, devoid of Krishna consciousness from time immemorial, means that they can't remember, right? So it means at some point, maybe I was with Krishna, but I just forgot it. And some conditions happened that made me fall to this world, right? So we know a whole opposite Dantic idea arose of devotees being able to fall directly from the spiritual world. So we just know by all of our acharyas, including our Srila Prabhupada, this is not a fact. It's not possible, right? Sabata dong sarahitam yajapi dong shakarane yad bhava bandano you know prema parikirtita. If you have prema relationship with Krishna, it says that that relationship cannot be broken under any circumstance. Sabata dong sarahitam yad api dong shakarane. Even if there was a so called cause, karana, it still cannot break. <laughs> this is the very nature of prema. That relationship cannot be broken. So there is no way to fall from a Prem Seva relationship in any Nitya Dham with Bhagavan. So we cannot fall from the spiritual world. So that's number one. So the argument ensued, well, if we don't use the word from time immemorial, then because many devotees have accepted this idea of falling from the spiritual world or that we, you know, we somehow or another at a particular historical time came to the material world, it would be confusing if we just say time without beginning. But the fact of the matter is the word means time without any beginning. And in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, in the conversation between Maharaj Nimi and the Navi Yogindras, it's again quoted. Anadi avijya yukta sha purusha shaveratmanam swato na samavatya nya ganatva ganado bhavet. Right? That the condition of the jiva is from Anadi Kal. Anadi Avidya Yukta means their connection, the connection of the Jivas with Avidya is Anadi. There was no beginning to it. And if you read the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, text number 20, right, it also mentions there that the Purusha and Prakriti, their existence has been together from time without any beginning. And then if you read the Tika, commentary of Vishnu Chakravati Thakurpada, in Sartha Varshini Tika, not Sartha Darshini, Sartha Varshini Tika, Bhagavad Gita, he clearly explains. He asks and answers this question. Yes, that the karmic connection of the jiva and my etc. is without any beginning. So now many devotees become very hopeless. Oh my gosh, I've been in the material world from time without any beginning. Is there any hope for me to ever get out of here? Therefore, perhaps this is the main reason that Gurudev always said two things primarily. Don't be weak and don't be hopeless. <laughs> Bhakti is so powerful. So don't be weak, don't be hopeless. Don't be without hope. You understand? So, anadi means time without any beginning. But Jiva Goswami in Tattva Sandabi says another meaning or another additional uh, extension of the meaning of the word anadi is something that has no beginning but it does have an end. So the fact that we have been in the material existence under the influence of avidya from anadikal doesn't mean it's a permanent state of existence. In fact, it cannot be. Because Mahabhubhu said, Jivera Sarup Hoya Krishnera Nityadas. Jiva Goswami also quotes Padma Purana. Dasibhuta Hari Eva Nanyasha Eva Karachan. Karachan means time. So now Anyasha Eva. Certainly nothing else. Dasabhuta Hari Eva. Certainly the Jiva is only a servant of Bhagavan. 
So there's no way any jiva can stay in the material world perpetually. So the world, the word anadi here means, though their existence in the material world has no beginning, it does have an end. When does it end? When he contacts bhakti. Yes, when he contacts bhakti. At the time of contacting bhakti. At that time, the avidya influence on the atma is broken and the ananta, the unending sojourn to perfection starts and does not end. Nihabrakamana shoshti pratyavayo na vidyate. Swaapamapiyasha dhamasha prayate mahatobaya. Don't fear because any progress that you make in bhakti is permanent. It cannot be taken away except by aparad. I'm sorry for my eyes getting so big because <laughs> aparad is like that. That's the only thing that can take away huh? your advancement in bhakti. Oh, yeah, bhakti is a permanent thing. So, therefore, bhakti is ananta. Our perfection is also ananta. Ananta means ananta. There is no end to it. Understand? So now he says, the jivas, they have been anadi, paratattva jnanam. Paratattva jnan here means knowledge of paratattva. What is the paratattva? Who am I? Who is Bhagavan? And what is my relationship? That is called paratattva jnan. The jiva has been samsaraga abhav. So samsaraga abhav means, the word abhav is another term taken from nyai or navinyai. Abhav means the absence of something. So in this case, I don't, again, I don't want to deflect and go down the studies of nyai, but in nyai, there are different kinds of abhav. One kind of abhav is called prag abhav, prior non-existence. Right, I'm giving an example. If you buy a notebook and your intention is to use a notebook in school, when you buy the notebook, that notebook is prog above of any kind of writing. Because when you open a book, there's nothing in there. So prior to your acquiring the book, it is prog above of any kind of writing. Now, soon it will become the, the abode, right? Of, or Anuyogi is what the word is used, the Anuyogi, the actual place of your writing. So you'll write so many notes, you'll write so many lessons. At that time, the prog above, right, is gone. Because now it is no longer without content, it has content in it. Now, the, the other thing is called Pradhamsa above. And like I said, I don't want to go down this track too deeply because we'll lose time and we'll also lose our subject matter. Pradhamsa above means... Subsequent destruction of something that cannot be, again, put back. So you take your book and you toss it in the fire and it burns up to ashes. Even if you collect the ashes, you can never put back things as they were. This is called Pradang Shabal, or subsequent non-existence. So the jivas are the prag abhav, the prior instruments of non-existence of Paratatva Gyan. In other words, there was no prior time when the devotees had a relate, excuse me, the jivas or atmas had relationship with Krishna and it was lost. In other words, they have never been imbued with swarup shakti because paratattva gyan only comes in the descent of swarup shakti. That's why we have the verse Sudha sattva visheshatma prema suyamsa samyava. When swarup shakti descends to the jiva at that time, Paratattva Gyan also descends. Understand? In complete form. Throughout the process of bhakti, Swarup Shakti is descending in drops. Right? Through Gurudev Harikatha, through taking Harinam, doing sudden bhajan. Then Swarup Shakti is gradually, gradually coming, going through the stages of Anishtita Bhakti, coming to Nishta, Ruchi, Asakti, etc. Right? So in Bhav, it just becomes more complete. And of course, in Prem, it is complete. Right? So, prior to that time, the jivas did not have that Swarup Shakti. They were devoid or the Abhav of Paratattva Gyan. Now, because they did not have this Paratattva Gyan, right? Tat Vai Mukya Labda Chidraya. So, Tat Vai Mukya means, therefore, by disposition naturally, they are Vai Mukya or they turn away from the tendency for service to Bhagavan. 
because they have no paratatva gyan. Now, remember, as we're speaking, we're not talking about a historical narrative. So don't think, oh, there was a time when I turned against Bhagavan. No. This has been the anadi nature, anadi swabhav, to touch the swabhav of the jiva. It was not a time when, you know, I made a decision on it. So now I know the question becomes, well, why is that narrative given by Bhaktivinoda Thakur? It's repeated by our acharyas coming in line from Bhaktivinoda Thakur. I'll get to that point of why that's done. But let's stick with Jiva Goswami here. So Jiva Goswami says, because they have this lack of Swarup Shakti, Paratatva Gyan, they are subject to be Vaimukya towards Krishna. In that stage of being, state rather, of being Vaimukya to Krishna, then Maya of Rita Swarup Gyananam. Therefore, Maya has the potency because the Atma is ripe for it to cover Maya. Excuse me, to cover the Atma. Maya has then the potency to cover the Jivatma because of the lack of Swarup Shakti. Now, covering the Atma, what is covered? Swarup Gyananam, knowledge of his own nature. You can also say knowledge of his Siddhadeha, etc., etc., because that in his nature, in the full unfoldment, all those things are there. So here Maya covers those things. But don't confuse that Swarup here means that the Jiva Siddhadeha is in the conditioned Jiva and is covered. Because the Siddhadeha is composed of Swarup Shakti, and Swarup Shakti cannot be covered by Maya. So please don't make this mistake. Right? This is a whole conversation that's been going on for a couple of years now. Devotees being confused about what is the Swarup of the Jiva and all these things. Be clear on these points. Guru Dev has also emphasized these points when you listen carefully. Right? The Swarup of the Jiva, in terms of his Siddha Deha, etc., is composed of Swarup Shakti. It cannot be covered by Maya. What is covered by Maya is the Atma devoid of Swarup Shakti. Now, is there something in the Atma? Yes. He is Swarup Yogyata. He has potential. The, if the potentiality, because he's Dasi Hari, Dasi Bhuta Hari Eva, he's the servant of Krishna by constitution. So certainly that potentiality and the potency related to all of those spiritual perfections exist in the Atma. Not the actual forms of those things, but the potential of those things. So Guru Dev, our Parampara, giving the example of the seed. In a seedling, an apple seed, for instance, an apple tree is there in potential. And if it undergoes the process of unfoldment, being planted, being watered, being nourished, etc., etc., it will grow and it will produce apples. <laughs> so the potential is there. But if you cut the seed open, you're not going to find a tree with edible apples, etc., etc. So that's the example. So Maya Abhritta Sarup Gyananam. So he covers the knowledge of the jiva's uh, nature, spiritual nature, or swaru. Taya Eva Sattva Rajasthamo Maya Jare Pradhane. As a result of that, now we give entrance to the three modes of nature to write a script for you. Because when Maya covers the Atma, it does so by the Shakti called Avidya Shakti. Vidya means knowledge. Avidya means ignorance or absence of knowledge. Right? That literally means absence of knowledge. So the absence of knowledge is what creates ignorance. Now, because the Jiva is ignorant, right, of their relationship and identity in relation to Bhagavan, but Ahamartha, remember Jiva Goswami said he has a value. So in order to exploit that I am somebody, right, Maya helps you out through the facility of a vidya or ignorance to give you an identity. How does she do that? She projects onto your chitta from time without beginning a false identity. It is called Ahamkara. Ahamkara literally means aham. Kara means karta and karana. I am the doer and the cause of everything happening in my life. And we've already discussed from Bhagavad Gita, I've quoted already several times, Prakriti Kriya Manani Gunai Kamini Sarvasha. Ahamkara Vimodatma. The jiva who thinks like that is actually bewildered by this avidya. He thinks he's the doer of material activities. But actually they're being carried out. Sattva Rajas Tamo Maya Jade Pradhane. They are the foundation of what is being carried out as the material narrative. So now here's what becomes interesting. 
because this material avidya is very unique it has five features that first feature is called ignorance itself then asmita asmita me asmi means i am who am i the ahamkara is the basis for where asmi comes ahamkara asmi i am whatever it is that my karma and my previous existence and sanskars are telling me that's who i think i am so asmi i am somebody who ahamkara i am the doer and cause of activities of upadi the particular upadi or designation that has come from my karma and previous samskaras in the previous life therefore in this life i am mukunda mohini's husband is a police officer he did this thing he did that thing that drama of the three modes of material nature is being shown onto my chitta just like a movie is shown onto a tv screen and the atma is vicariously identifying with it by having accepted the designation of the upadi supplied by asmita hamkara now with that designation he seeks out to fulfill their nature by rag and dwesh rag and dwesh means trying to get happiness and trying to avoid misery because it's in the nature of the atma that there's no misery so when he encounters misery the unnatural connection is like magnets when they have the opposite polarity and they push away from each other that's what happens but the jiva has the a uh, natural proclivity towards ananda or happiness so when something comes that appears to be happiness like the magnet is when the two polarities are set properly it attracts like the magnet attracts iron so whenever misery comes the magnet is in reverse polarity and it pushes away when the magnets are in the right polarity for attraction like iron and magnets we attract to whatever material things we think give us pleasure this is rag and dwesh now it can be very easily said oh mukunda great now you've explained it our guru vargas have explained it it's written down for us to see every day so from tomorrow i'll decide that i don't want to be in maya anymore not so easy because the fifth function of avidya is called abhinivesh abhinivesh means the power to so completely absorb the atma via the chitta and the influence of avidya being projected on the chitta <coughs> excuse me that it's so overwhelming that the jiva cannot extricate himself or herself from it without help therefore in that verse i quoted from the 11th canto it's 2210 is the actual verse anadi avidya yukta sha purusha shavera atmanam swato na sambhavati You cannot extricate yourself from Maya on your own. Not possible. Swato na sambhavati anya. Only someone else can do it. Who? Ganatva, ganadha bhavet. Bhavet is an imperative in Sanskrit. It means it must come from someone who's ganatva. Ganatva means who's sadhu guru, and ganadha means who has the inclination or proclivity to give it to you, <laughs> because the sadhu can have it. but they have to be disposed towards giving it to you right for sadhus are merciful by nature so they want to give but the reason this is mentioned because it's not just that by coming in proximity to a sadhu that simply erases maya no that sadhu has to give you their kripa in their kripa shakti is imbued the mercy of swarup shakti it's that swarup shakti that breaks the influence of abhinavesh or this complete absorption in ignorance Right? That's why Chaitanya Charitamrita that verse is there. Brahmanda Brahmati Kon Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasade Bhai Poi Bhakti Ratavij. When Krishna and Guru give their kripa, and one becomes bhaga, very fortunate. That time, <laughs> they get the bhakti ratavij. That beach first appears. Sava Song Ah Satan Sava Songa Mena Ratnya Angkor Rupa Eva Mati. that bhakti lata beads the seed of it first appears as mati in sanskrit mati means discrimination the, the kind of discrimination it makes you ask the question that sanatan goswami pad asked ke ami who am i i know i cannot be this material designation 
because I don't know who I am, I'm asking Guru Sadhu, Ke Ami, who am I? Ke ne am I? Jare Tapatraya, why am I suffering? This is what the influence of receiving the Bhakti Lata in the form of Mukti, that seed, that's what happens. Later that seed unfolds to Krishna Seva Vasan. The desire and the tendency towards now serving Krishna in understanding I'm not this material designation, etc. You understand? So Jiva Goswami Pad, he's mentioned finally, huh? Rachitatma bhavanam jivanam samsara dukkam cha ganapitam. Where has dukkha come from? It has come from this relationship between avidya, the modes of nature, and the vicarious identification of the jivas with it. Yes. There is no dukkha in the atma itself. It has come from the vicarious identification with the influence of avidya on the chitta. Just like if you watch a movie or a drama play and you make an emotional investment in the characters in that play, then whatever happens in the narrative of the drama, you're emotionally identified with it, so you feel fear, anxiety, happiness, sadness, distress, anger, all from the vicarious identification with the narrative going on in the movie or drama play, etc., etc. In the same way, the Jivatma looking at his chitta, he's identifying with the material narrative through karma, karma na dhaivan na trena, jantu deo bhaktiye, every life according to your karmas and your previous samskars, you get a unique karmic portfolio that plays out, and that drama is shown on your chitta, and with the, oh yes, 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 that's me. Whatever happiness or suffering comes from that, we're vicariously identifying with it. Until we get the mercy of Sadhu Guru. At that time, ha, by hearing the Harikata, by hearing Harinam, by receiving any Mahaprasad, by any kind of previously acquired Agyata Sukriti, finally getting Sadhu Sangha some way, form or fashion, then Mati arises and discrimination arises and the question comes, no, 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 I'm not this material body, ke ami. And then we inquire from that sadhu, and this begins our sojourn in bhakti, which we will pick up in our next installment. But this is the Atma Tattva, or Jiva Atma Tattva, as described by Jiva Goswami Pad in Paramatma Sundarva, beginning with Anuched 19 and running through there. And a description in the first Anuched of Bhakti Sundarva, describing how that very Jiva Atma I described in Paramatma Sundarva how he's come to be in the situation that he's in. And again, we have to accept that this condition is anadi. It is without any beginning. But again, don't be hopeless. Why? Because even though this situation is anadi, still, in the long run, because the jiva cannot be anything but the servant of Hari, right? Gradually, at some point in your existence, you'll have to meet Sadhu Guru, and this cycle will be broken. Now you could complain. You could say, well, I'm going to appeal to the civil rights organizations as to why I had to suffer up to this point. And I may even want to bring Bhagavan up on civil rights charges. Such kind of craziness comes, right? So even Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he explained in the 16th chapter of Jaya Dharma, listen, Bhagavan is Leela Mai. He has so much attraction to so many different types of Leela. This Tristi Leela is also one of Bhagavan's Leelas that you participated in this Leela, right? And under the influence of England, you suffered, but Bhagavan came and saved you. Why are you unhappy now? Only the question of your own suffering will still arise if you still make emotional connection or identification with having been this material body. Because then you start to think, wait a minute, I was cheated. Also, this is why it's important to understand the narrative of the fact that we were in a position into Tasta Shakti where we looked one way or looked another way. Bhakti Vinod Thakur himself in the first chapter of Jaya Dharma and in the 15th chapter of Jaya Dharma said, I've spoken these things only as examples. I did not speak them as a historical narrative. Gurudev used to simplify, he used to say, yes, 
Like mustard seeds fall on a blade of a knife, some go to one side, some go to another. Why? Because this idea is not really that important. Even Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote in the 15th chapter, I beg you, don't make super amount of inquiry into this thing. Right? Do sudden bhajan. In sudden bhajan, it will easily be revealed in the heart. Bhumipati Babu excellently showed me in the first chapter of Jaiva Dharma. Right? I read Jaiva Dharma so many times, but he's reminding me again. Look, in the very first chapter of Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivinoda Thakur concludes this. Listen, not until you do bhajan and the realization arises in your heart, right? Will you understand that all the other things I have spoken were for examples? And unless you give up the idea of being attached to the examples, until and unless you give that up, you cannot fully allow it to manifest through bhajan in your heart. What is the truth? And when the truth manifests, even if Krishna put you here from time without any beginning and punished you, are you angry at Krishna? Are you angry at Srimati Radhika? Are you angry at the residents of Braj? There's not much of bhakti. You cannot say, I want Anya Abhilasita Sunya. Bhakti free from any desires except for the desire for social justice based on my karmic reality of having been here and having, quote, had to suffer. Anatopasamam sakshat, bhakti yogams and hope to jump. Right? Vyasadev, it's written in Bhagavatam that the suffering of the jiva is superfluous to him. He says, Chakra Sattva Samitam, I wrote Bhagavatam to explain this to you. You didn't suffer. You thought you were suffering because you were watching the movie over and over and over again, lifetime after lifetime. You thought you were suffering. Don't blame that on Bhagavan, please. <laughs> All right, I think uh, I want to leave time at least a little bit for any questions from devotees on the phone. The devotees on the phone, they've heard this already because I spoke this kata on the phone conference itself. And also this year while traveling, uh, we also spoke it while we were traveling in many places. So it's not something they have not heard. But I realized in doing it in a live stream, many devotees hadn't. And in order to set the base for the future classes about bhakti and reaching perfection, we had to establish what is atma tattva first, what is the nature of how the jivas exist in material condition, then we can go on from that platform. So I will stop here and ask devotees if there are any questions. If I'm not capable of answering, I think there are many devotees on the phone and it should be. Now let me first figure out how I can get to see what people are writing or not writing. I've never used this before, so bear with me. Okay, I think I see how devotees are writing. So I think it pops up. I wish I could see it better, but I can't. Oh no, that's for me to write it. Have you all? Okay, so the devotees on the phone conference, they're unmuting now. So if anybody has any questions or comments, um, our Puja Pad Shanta Maharaj is on the phone, and, and I think Shri Siddhanti Maharaj is on the phone. So anyway, if we do have any questions, I at least know I can. I can have a recourse to ask <laughs> because I have Bhumi, uh, I think um, Ma Bhuti Babu is on the phone and many other devotees. So I think whatever does come up, we can certainly find out the answer. Okay, any questions? Can we get a copy? Can we get a copy, Bhumi, of that? It's really nice. Okay. All right. Also, yeah, did the phone, did the live stream thing work out? I've never done this before. So, did it come out right? I mean, was everything okay? Okay. Yeah, it's the first time doing it. So, at least I know now that it, it works. Okay, so at least I know it works. Right? And uh, anything that I've said wrong, I'm begging devotees to please forgive me. I might have made so many mistakes. It's, you know, certainly my nature, I make so many mistakes. So if, if it is, then I'm begging all the senior devotees, especially, they can correct it in comments or something so that people have the right information. Uh, I'm sure Pujapat, uh, Siddhanti Maharaj, Shanta Maharaj was on, other 
senior devotees, uh, and as other devotees see it, they'll make corrections. Yes. Yes. Like yes. We discussed that yesterday. Like you look out the window and you see, you tell a child, oh, the moon is on the tree. Yes. The moon is not really on the tree, but it appears to be that way. So still on the conference. Still on the conference. Never and never. Like Guru Dave said, never and never again. Mm -hmm. Yes. Unmuted. Mm. Yeah. So this that's a very, very, very important point. Very important point. So we need to, you know, be able to digest that. This is called Chandra Shakya Nyai, the logic of the tree branch. Also, in the 15th chapter, Bhaktivinoda Thakur described it as Arun Dati Darshan Nyai. It means like if there's a star which is very distant and you want to find that star, then you may point to a star that's closer so that you have a visual reference and then from there say, now look left from there. It's called Arundhati Darshan Nyai. Right? So in the same way, examples and so forth are given to give us a reference point. But now once you have a reference point and you do bhajan, then the actual spotvad means realization will arise in the heart and give the actual realization and understanding uh, of the nature of a particular tattva, in this case, atma tattva. Right? Because our acharyas cannot be in disagreement. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's not writing something. If you read Paramahasandhava and you read 15th chapter Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivinoda Thakur is simply paraphrasing. But you have to have read the Paramahasandhava to see how he's paraphrasing Paramahasandhava. Right? And then he makes everything very clear. He tells Brajanath, he says, listen, I realize there's only two states of existence of the jiva, liberated and conditioned. Right? So he acknowledges there's no third state of the jiva. Right? So then devotees ask a lot about the examples given, like a fish swimming in the bank of, uh, in a river and going from one bank to another. Well, I explain. This is a verse that's quoted from the Brihad Aranyakya Upanishad. And in that particular section of the Upanishad, it's describing how consciousness fluctuates between waking and dreaming, and then when the body is finished, how the soul, with the Shukshma Sharir, Tra traverses with the subtle body to a new body. Bhaktivinoda Thakur used an example in that chapter to give a pictorial example of how the jiva is tatashta, meaning he's eligible to be influenced either by Swarup Shakti or by Avijja Shakti of Maya. He didn't describe it as an actual historical narrative that we're in a locale and we looked at the spiritual world and looked at the material world and said, well, I choose Vegas over Golok Bhadnavan. <laughs> he didn't do that. I'm being facetious, but you get the idea. I also beg devotees, please, to um, forgive my um, inability to, to do these kind of things a lot, because I, I also feel there are many very highly qualified devotees who are traveling and preaching. So we have our little circle of traveling and preaching, and among our friends on the phone conference, you know, uh, there's no harm. Uh, they're all encouraging me and correcting everything. So I've always been a little shy to do like these kind of public sort of situations and arrangements. So I'm begging you forgive me for any um, mistakes or inability to communicate things well. So I'll ask you to forgive me for that. And um, only by the encouragement of Maharaj and others, I'll uh, continue for this Kartik Moss to try to finish out this seminar series. And of course, maybe I'll see some people when we travel next time. Uh, hopefully like that. All right, if there's no more questions or comments, then I will end the live stream on Facebook. Uh, and then we have a few more minutes on the phone and we'll go ahead and uh, if there's no more questions on the phone, we'll wrap up there too. 
So my dandavat pranam to all the devotees who no, came no, on the no, Facebook no, no, stream. Okay, Shimon, I'm going to come back to the phone comments. I'm not going to hang up here. I'm just going to end the live stream on Facebook. Jai, Vanchakalpaturvisha, Kripashin, Dvayevachor, Putita Nampavne, Vaishnavi, Vyonamon, Vyonamon.